<laughs> Say what? Yeah. Ready for Ready. Jesus. What, uh, what year, approximately, did you first associate yourselves with First Assembly? Uh, with First Assembly? I don't mean First Assembly. We're already on the other one. It was called Newport okay. Beach Assembly it was, uh, of God. Uh, June and I, along with Cindy, first uh, came to Newport Beach Assembly of God uh, December 1955. Cindy was two weeks old. <laughs> she said she'd try to remember back then. She's having some trouble. We'll probably remember. <laughs> at that time, the church was located at, uh, right on the ocean front, a little, a little old store building, and uh, right in front of the store building was the walk and then the beach, all the sand, and uh, just, just right there. And when did the church move to the Granger Building? To the American Legion Building? Some call it Granger, some American Legion. Stop, stop the tape and I can tell you. <laughs> um, that would have been sometime in 1956, I believe. We moved to, um, uh, back to the American Legion Building. The church mm -hmm. originally started in the American Legion Building years before that. Because we had Delora, but Heather wasn't born yet. That's no. how I can remember. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, who was the pastor when you came? Ira Pratt was the pastor in 55, yes. Mm -hmm. Was there any involvement in missions about that time? Yes. Um, I think, was it $5 a month that we gave to Orville Hopkins? And who was the other? Uh, Bob and Doris Turnbull. And... Um, we were interested in missions, but we didn't have many resources at the time. At that time, the congregation consisted of about uh, three, three elderly adults, about 15 children, and um, the pastor and his wife. That and, was the total congregation, and us. so, <laughs> well. <laughs> what attracted you to the church? I think the first night that we came, we really felt the Spirit of the Lord there. It was so sweet, and it was tiny, and we felt the love of the Lord there, and we felt it was a church that we could really do something in. They needed it. Mm -hmm. the, the first night that we attended the church, we hadn't really planned to go to Newport Beach Church. We started out to a different church, and the Lord must have known that that's where we had to be because the fog was so heavy that we decided we weren't going to drive any further and June knew that there was a little church that met right over here close by and that's where we you know why and when we got there mm -hmm. so it must have been the Lord leading us in that direction because we had started out that night going to another church I had attended the church um, when I was in college my freshman year in 1950 so um, I was uh, well aware of the church being there and where it was. <laughs> what, uh, what are your favorite memories from that church? Oh, we've got one that I just always like to remind. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is a good one. Let's see, what, what year was that? What, you're thinking what of. year was that? Well, I was 26 years old. 26 years old, and June received the bouquet of roses for being the oldest mother in church on Mother's Day. And other than the pastor's wife, I think I was the only mother because the older ladies weren't mothers. <laughs> During that period of time, um, what, uh, what ramifications did the war years do to you there? Do you remember, did you have outreaches in that area? The Korean War or? Um, well, World War I. War II. Well, we were a little past that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that that had any, um, any impact on the church at all at that time. Did you have any outreaches to servicemen? We, uh, we weren't there during the war. It was, see, that was in 1953. Three, I mean, 55. 50, 55 and beyond. And so the war was over by then. The, the only relics, the, the relics of the war were the barracks at what is now SEC. <laughs> okay. Uh, what do you remember about Costa Mesa in those days? Bean fields. <laughs> very, very small 
a farm community for, you know, a lot of it was just, like, like June says, it was bean fields. There was no such thing as South Coast Plaza. There was Reinerts. <laughs> uh, Newport, um, Newport Avenue was a small, uh, very small road at that time. All of, you know, the entire shopping district of Costa Mesa was uh, probably less than um, about two blocks two, block, two blocks long on Newport, okay. and that was it. Mm -hmm. Very very small, quiet um, community. The college moved in and see what happened. <laughs> you won't. <laughs> what do you? Uh, what do you uh, feel was the cause of growth? For oh, at the, at the church. Yeah. What do you say, June? A lot of people working real hard and praying hard, and uh, trusting the Lord. It wasn't one person. It wasn't one personality. It was a lot of people getting their hands dirty and working shoulder to shoulder, and not giving up. <laughs> If I can ask this about the merger, do you remember the first Sunday when the two churches met together? And do you remember anything about it? The things that I can remember about it, it was a very exciting time as the two congregations came together for the first time. And where in Newport, we had been having uh, double morning services when we went into the First Assembly uh, facility. We had one single service that Sunday morning, and the place was jammed to the rafters, mm -hmm. and it was just a very exciting, very exciting service. It was an exciting time, and we just all felt the presence of the Lord and felt that the Lord had blessed the union of the two churches. And how long was it before we had to start going to two services again? That started almost immediately. I think the, the combined service was just so that everyone would get an opportunity to to see everyone from both uh, from both congregations, but it was almost immediate that uh, the double services were resumed. What kind of preparations took place uh, before that first service to get the buildings ready and all that? We don't know because we were from well, the other church, really. Well, so. I can remember. Oh. I can remember. Oh, I remember work, that. Work, work crews. Uh, there were work days and. Uh, work weeks and whole, you know, large groups of uh, people went over there, big work crews, to, um, to get the facility in, uh, in shape and take, take some areas that had been in storage areas and make them into Sunday school classrooms because we needed every, you know, every possible space that could be, uh, that could be utilized. Um, some, some old structures were removed to, to enlarge the parking lot and oh, big dumpsters full of uh, full of the debris from that and everything else, and uh, just a lot of uh, a lot of work refurbishing everything, a lot of paint up, a lot of miscellaneous fix up, and uh, getting getting everything ready to go. Why did the church not expand at that location instead of moving to the college? Oh. I mean, why didn't we just, uh, attempts were made to buy adjacent properties and uh, the, some of the properties just weren't available for sale or the prices had been jacked up so high that it was just impractical. And even if you took all of the property that was available on that block, it was insufficient to meet the needs. So we moved to the chapel. Mm -hmm. And uh, how did that work out having services in the chapel? As an interim, it worked great. We had the additional space that we needed, but still kept the double services. Um, the church grew very rapidly during that time, so it must have been having the, having good. the space available mm -hmm. allowed for the church to grow, and um, not having the financial pressures of a parking. You know, all all the parking was all there. Enough space in the building was there. And so it allowed the church to accumulate the additional money needed to, um, to get going on the building project. It was, you know, the, the college chapel never, 
never was designed to be a church facility. It was a college chapel, but it was adapted and, and worked out well for that interim period. How many building expansions can you remember coming from the beach to where we are now? You mean building ex expansions or transitions? We went from the little oceanfront building to the um, American Legion building. While we were the American Legion building, we expanded. We grew there and had to um, enlarge into one of their old storage buildings and cleaned it up, painted it, and made it usable into Sunday school classrooms. Then from there, we moved to a small um, building that had been part housing and part barn and part horse stables uh, at 15. 15th and Monrovia. From on that property, we ended up building an A-frame building and then uh, an 8,000 square foot Sunday school building. See, from then from that point, of course, was the, was the merger and you have that story. Um, if you could say one thing to the congregation for the future, what, what would be your words to the congregation today? Wow. What would be our, our words to the congregation today? Turn off the tape. <laughs> it's bleeding, but it's rolling now. Okay. Uh, I think the thing, uh, if there's any, any one thing that I would recommend to any individual is get established in, your, in the church. Just plant your feet and plant your seat <laughs> and decide that this is where I am going to serve the Lord, not just attend. Don't just be a pew potato. Uh, get involved. There are hundreds of ministry opportunities available. Uh, the opportunities for service, the opportunities for ministry abound, and I believe that you can only truly be serving the Lord if you get involved in some of those opportunities that are there. Whether it be a small group ministry, the small home prayer groups, the Sunday school, the visitation, the outreach, the missions, there's, there's just everything available. Get involved. What, uh, if there was uh, one crisis where you really saw the Lord working in the very early days of the church, in, in uh, Glad Tidings and prior, uh, what do you think it would be that you could really see the hand of the Lord guiding and working? I don't know. I remember a time when um, there wasn't enough money to pay the pastor's salary, and uh, the ushers got together and prayed over it, and then they reached into their own pockets and made up the difference and uh, that was a real special time and then the time that the missions uh, that special missions uh, I can remember that one Okay. Uh. John has probably heard this story so many times and it's been preached from the pulpit so many times but um, it was shortly after George started coming to the church and the congregation um, there was a transition in the congregation and a decline for, for a few months, and it became very difficult to support the ministry of the church and continue paying the missions, the missions budget that we had established. And I can remember a little, uh, you know, at one of the Saturday morning board meetings in the back room of a restaurant, um, we were faced with this problem of what to do. And it was, de it was decided that day that um, the next morning, without any word being said to the congregation about any special need, that whatever came in would first go to meet our mission's commitment. And if there was anything left over, we'd pay other bills. And I can remember George saying, what about salaries? And that's when I piped up and said, I understood that to include any obligation, including salaries. And we settled on it and prayed on it right there and then. And the next morning, without any word being said to anyone but the Lord, one of the largest offerings in the history of the church. That's, that's an exciting, exciting way of God providing and, 
and showing that, that his hand was in what was being done and that his way is the way. Do you remember anything about a mysterious check in 22nd Street? Um, I thought that was well over uh, I know 15th the, and Monrovia. We had a mysterious check at, uh, at uh, 15th and Monrovia where, um, oh, who was that? Paul uh, and Silas or something? It was, no, Paul and Barnabas. We got a check from Paul and Barnabas for uh, a very substantial amount. And, of course, we looked at that check and we thought, let's not count that one until we check with the bank. And the next morning, checked with the bank and certainly... Uh, they, they just said that check is absolutely good, just deposit it. But we never did, we never did find out who, the, who that person was. That was 22nd Street, I remember too. <laughs> That's why I asked it. I thought it was in 15th and Monrovia. No, it was in 22nd Street. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe it happened again. Who knows? Uh, it was Paul and Barnabas. Okay. Uh, not, no. Yeah, it was Paul and Barnabas. Uh -huh. But, uh, yeah. Mm. And it, Mission Convention, I built, I built a map, lighted map for. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, let's see what I've forgotten now. Um, anything else you'd like to add to this that would help enhance the history? Well, well I, go ahead. one thing I'd like to say is to young families, to if you find a church like ours that you like, stay with it because one of the wonderful benefits and bonuses that you don't, the cream on the cake, is when you get to be our age and have grandchildren, all seven of our grandchildren attend Newport Mesa Christian Center and uh, three of our children and their w wives or husbands and the other, a few others would but they're too far away right now but at least uh, when they're in the area they come. So there are many, many benefits to just putting your roots down and sticking with it, but that's one of the best. <laughs> Have all these years been, um, you know, top of the world? There have been some problems. There have been some trials. There have been some frustrations. You know, it's a wonder what prayer will do. So I can't think of anything else about the history of the church. Um, other than it's like watching your children grow up to see a church grow up. <laughs> and it's good to see it grow, but it's not through growing yet. And just like children growing up, you have to let go. It's the same with the church. It's not our church, it's God's church. And he's in control. Okay. Oh my, the, the early days of the church were so different, of course, from what I had grown up knowing in New England, that it was just uh, one series of contrasts from the big stately churches of New England to the small, very ordinary storefront building down on the oceanfront in Newport. Uh, I think another thing that I really felt was uh, uh, very different was the interest that uh, Dan and Esther Pakoda took in us as young people, and there there was just a large number of young people in that church, and they just had a wonderful interest in us. I remember my father, who was really not a Christian at all, had very little to do with the church, very bitter man, uh, was deeply impressed by Dan and Esther Pakoda in their simple faith and humility and trust in God. Those are things that come to my mind. Oh, let's see. When I started, it was uh, Dan Pakoda. And Dan had been there probably a year uh, before, before I started. And he was there about three years, from 50 to 53, that I knew him. Uh, 
And when was it that you first came to the church? You're approximately one year. 1950, fall of 1950. We moved to California from New England. And uh, Frank Hagerman, who is in my freshman algebra class at Newport Harbor, asked me to go to church with him. And so I went with him to the little Newport Beach Assembly God Church and, and started attending in my freshman year and was rather spasmodic during my sophomore year. It really didn't go a lot at all. And then during my junior year, uh, that's when I made my commitment to Christ in November, the second Sunday of November of 1952, made my decision for Christ. And there were about 12 kids that went forward that Sunday, as I remember it. And, uh, you know, Frank Hagerman and Doug Tugwell and Bonnie Jeannie Hoyam. Uh, I've lost contact with them all, though, at this point in time. I don't know when you started. 1954, I think. I was a freshman here at SCC. And Ray used to pick me up, take me to church, along with all the other girls. <laughs> remember that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember I, one Sunday I came to pick up students at SCC and I had on a bland, brand new suit. And they used to have rose bushes out from what's now the student union up there. And I was picking roses to take to church so there'd be some color there of some sort. And I tore my brand new suit on the rose bushes out there by the student union. And uh, Ruby's mother, what they call that when they, you know, that. Re-weave it. Yeah, rewove it. And so you couldn't even tell it was torn, but it was quite an embarrassing moment considering it was a brand new suit. Well, I'm sure you have a lot of memories of Costa Mesa in those days. Oh, the town? Oh, it was a lot smaller than it is now, of course. Back then, the phone numbers were Harbor and Beacon, and you'd pick up the phone, and the operator would come on, and you'd ask them, ask them what number, uh, they, they would ask you what number you wanted, and then uh, you'd give them the number, and that was for the first couple of years. I think the other thing that really impressed me when we first came to California was the beautiful... Spanish architecture of California. I was just taken back by it. The stucco and the red tile roofs and just the whole Spanish motif that's so uh, present in California. I uh, was just really struck by that. Was there any special thrust in the church at that time? He, well, I think by necessity <clears throat> because we're almost all young people at the church. And so, obviously, they were ministering to teens, Dan and Esther, and then Orville, and Fern Hopkins, and uh, Ira and Betty Pratt, who came later. later. And, and they did a lot of things for us. You know, we'd go out to Irvine Park, or uh, we'd have... Uh, one of the interesting things about that early time in the church was that we were only able to use the front part of that store building for services and they were still using the back portion for storage and uh, so we would hold service in the front and then when it was time for Sunday school we'd go sit in cars out in the side streets and I think my first Sunday school teacher was John Hopkins and he would sit in the front holding his quarterly kind of by the steering wheel and there'd be four or five of us sitting around him in the car, and that would be where we'd have our Sunday school lesson. Very interesting experiences in those early days, you know. Uh, it, it, it just showed the dedication on their part to be faithful in something that was still, you know, very much a pioneer work, very much upper class. And here was this little Assembly of God church trying to struggle, struggle with young people in Newport. Do you want to do that? <coughs> then well, I'll come in. <coughs> mine is that we got married there, 1960, and that's when uh, <coughs> the Schultzes were there. And um, then I left right after that, 1960. That was on the bluff. 
Yeah, I, I remember some interesting episodes, a couple of them. We, uh, I was, what back then was called CAs, the Christ Ambassadors. And uh, one year we were promoting uh, the Christ Ambassador CA camp for the following summer. And we got an old box, made it up to look like a casket, put one of the Hoyam girls in the casket, had her all laid out there with a the flower and everything. And we talked about dead CAs, you know, and how they needed to come to life. And then partway through, oh, we had dirges and everything. It was you know, almost sacrilegious, perhaps, you know. But then we finally talked about CA camp. And Bonnie or Jeannie, whoever it was, jumped up out of the casket and said, CA camp, is that for real? And, uh, and of course, it just really uh, was a winner. Kids really went to camp, and a lot of them came to the Lord. Another thing was... Uh, the walls of the old store building were very thin. And on the north side of the church was uh, some apartments. And the apartment manager's name was Jake. Well, uh, during the Sunday evening service, perhaps it got a little too noisy in prayer time, you know. And so Jake came over in the middle of the service to say, you've got to quiet down. You're bothering my tenants. You know, there's another thing I'll tell you about, too. That old store building, uh, the restroom was kind of like an outhouse on the back side of the building. So if to go to the restroom, you had to go through the back old part of the building and go outside into the alley and then go in through the side door into this little appendage onto the back of the building. And that was the... Uh, restroom back there, way in the back. What do you remember about moving to the Lord? Well, Pastor Pratt, I think it was Pastor Pratt really made the big, a lot of the initial efforts toward moving to the bluff. It, it was obvious that the church was not going to continue if it had to continue using like the Grange Hall, the American Legion, things like that, because it just wasn't going to succeed. It had to find a place, permanent home. And uh, apparently James Cagney owned some property, and so Ira went over and talked to James Cagney. Well, he wouldn't give him the time of the day. So it was obvious that that was not the answer for finding the property. But then they finally found some property up there at 15th and Monrovia, and there were a couple old buildings. And Ira... And then it was Pastor Schultz came in right about that same time. It was in, I would guess this was 58, 59, around in there, wouldn't it be? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, they had to get underneath those old buildings and shore them up because the foundation was so weak. And uh, uh, finally did get that property. And I don't know how much we paid for it. I don't think much more than $12,000, but it's been a long time ago. And... At that time, I was a trustee. I was 17 years old. So it would have to have been around, f well, this would go back. Anyway, I was a trustee, and uh, they had to contact the district office. And they talked to Dr. Fisher from Southern California Bible College. How could I be a trustee and sign papers when I wasn't legal age? And I don't know how they worked it out, but I did. And... Uh, that's how I remember basically the move up. It was a lot of work. It was a lot of work. And I remember Pastor Pratt especially put in hours and hours and hours. You were there more than me at that I point there, in time. Yeah. I was gone almost at that point in time. How big was the church when you first came? Back in the early 50s? Oh, my. <clears throat> well, there were 12 teenagers, and there were the students from SCBC, and I would guess that well, there were a lot of Sunday school kids, so we probably ran 30, 40 on Sunday morning, and we had on the wall uh, a record, an old phonograph record, and we wrote either 70 or 75 on it. I forget what it was and posted that on the wall, and we had to break the record. And when we finally broke the record, then we were able to, uh, our treat was to be able to break that record over Dan Picotta's head, <laughs> which we did. And he was a good sport about it. You know, it was all set up, and he, 
he knew it was coming. I think it had a crack in it already. <laughs> so, and we broke the record. And, uh, and then it was right at that time that Dan left. And we all wondered, will the church continue? Well, of course it did because the Hopkins came in and took right over and they had been working the church. So we all knew them. And uh, God continued to bless. Well, you go. <clears throat> well, I just think, you know, for people to just be faithful and find a need and fill it and just be faithful to the Lord and be there and be counted on. Just do it as unto the Lord. Yeah, and I think something that really triggers me, I think Southern California, it's true in the Northwest, but I think especially in Southern California where properties have gone up so much in value and people have hundreds of thousands of dollars in equity in their homes the attention on materialism is so great and the uh, temptation to center our minds in materialism is so great that sometimes we lose the perspective that this is a spiritual ministry and i think something that really has to be kept in focus is the fact that this is a spiritual ministry. It's not based on materialism. And you can have a very fine church, as Newport has, and thank God for that. Or you can have very humble, simple surroundings as the historical roots of this church. God's blessing is not dependent on physical surroundings. And I think we need to be very careful that we don't let materialism blind our eyes and think that's the blessing of God, because that's not necessarily a blessing of God can be a lot of other things. Anything else you'd like to say? <clears throat> no, not that I can think of. <laughs> I th I, this, is, this is our home church. I think while God has called us elsewhere, I think there's no question but Newport will always, always be home. Southern California College, Newport Mesa Christian Center. Th this is home, and uh, we love it. The, the people here are just wonderful, and thank God for every one of them. It's just a, just a delight to be here and to be able to renew friendships with these people because they're some of our very, very best friends in the world. So it's great to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs>
we were in college and SCC was located in Pasadena. Uh, Don Nelson and Harlan Selvey wanted to come down and start this church in Newport Beach. So I, they just asked me if I would help and so I just, I came down and, and helped. And so the very first Saturday we came down and passed out a thousand leaflets all over Lido Isle. And Newport Beach. And Newport Beach. And so uh, we had no idea, you know, how many would come to church the next morning. And, uh, but anyway, we came from Pasadena the next morning then and, and um, waited for our little church to come. And uh, we had five children. And that was all <laughs> out of those thousand leaflets. But that's how we started. So. And then uh, we, we did meet in the Legion Hall. I don't know. We haven't driven down there lately to know what is there. But uh, it was the Legion Hall at that time. And every Sunday morning, we came down early enough to air the place out, to sweep it out, uh, pick up all the cigarette butts and beer cans and uh, clean it out, and then uh, set the chairs up for for the meeting. So it was an interesting experience for, um, and uh, very rewarding, of course, in many ways. And then it was later on that we um, rented the, the storefront building. It used to be a meat market, and uh, the landlady uh, wouldn't take, a, take out the old uh, meat, case. The meat case, big, huge meat case. Mm -hmm. So Esther had to make some curtains that uh, stood behind the chairs that were behind the pulpit, and that shielded the, uh, this, uh, the view of this great big old white hul hulking meat case that uh, we had to put up with all those, time, all those years. Yeah. Right. yeah, it was, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say that meat market became our Sunday school office. That's where we had all our supplies, so it came in handy. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. That would have been 1950? No, you're, I think you would have come in 1949. Yeah. You started yeah. in 1949. Okay. That was mm -hmm. my first year in college. Yeah. And um, so that year. And then um, that summer I did kind of a, people thought I was crazy. But, you know, a little church like that, you don't have people to, to do different things. And uh, so you kind of do everything. And um, anyway, I worked in Fresno uh, during the week, and every weekend I came back to teach my class. <laughs> Rode and play the piano and yeah, yeah. and different things. Different things, yeah. yeah. Rode the Greyhound bus every uh, every took it Friday night. Every Friday night and came back every Sunday, I guess, mm -hmm. every Sunday night. So the bus drivers got to know who she was. Oh, they and they thought I was crazy, <laughs> but I, you know, I, I never even gave it a thought. Yeah. There was a need there, and so I just did it. So, and I, um, when, let's see, it would have been, uh, yeah, 49, the year that um, I was still at, it was my third year at Southern California Bible College, and um, I was involved in a, a gospel team. Uh, we came down to have a service at the Newport Beach Assembly of God, and um, I had no no anticipation, no expectation, no, nothing forewarned me that this was going to happen. But at the conclusion of the service, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that God was saying to me, this is where I want you to minister, to not to pastor at that point, but to come and assist and work in that church. And it was, uh, I, would, I wept, uh, bitterly. Bit, I don't know, <laughs> bitterly, but profusely at the altar just fighting God because one I wanted to travel in this group and uh, there was a gal in the group that I had my eyes on anyhow not and not Esther right and um, I knew that she wouldn't be interested in that kind of a situation so I was fighting God and uh, at that point and eventually I said yes to the Lord and it was at that time then I started to come we drove down and uh, from Pasadena to to the campus here, they let us use one of the old barrack buildings and had a stove and a kitchen in there so we could cook our meals. We stayed there, just lounged around and whatever, prayed and studied. 
stayed for the service and then drove back up to Pasadena that night. So that was my, that was my first year. And then the following summer, my senior year in college is when I became, uh, well, we weren't married then, but I became the pastor and, uh, at that time. Yeah. So it was the summer of 1950. Probably, um, you know, the church was small and, and the group was small, but those, those teenagers, and they lived at our house. And uh, so, but they were good times. We would, we would try to have like a choir practice or different things that we tried to do with them. Um, but they just lived at our house. And, and those were, in fact, we went by to look at the house where we used to live. And, um, lots of good memories there, yes. Probably for me, the, the most notable was that what I would consider to be a sovereign move of God's spirit uh, in the lives of about a, about a dozen of the young people. And um, I, can't, I don't remember what I had preached on that, that Sunday morning. I don't know, don't recall anything that prompted it in the first place, nothing. I can't recall anything. But uh, there was a, like I say, a sovereign move of God and these dozen teenagers uh, just moved to the front, came to the altar, and, um, or to the front anyhow, and uh, just gave their hearts to Christ. And uh, that probably is the, one of the, certainly one of the most uh, outstanding highlights in my mind as far as uh, as far as what the Lord, what the Lord did. A funny, <laughs> a funny thing that comes to mind, a lot of funny things happen, but it was before Esther and I were married, and uh, she was, we were both working in the church, I was pastor and she was helping me there, and uh, um, we were out on the beach in front of the church, we, uh, on the blanket there, and we were talking about our, our wedding plans. I don't know if you remember that or not. <laughs> we were talking about our wedding plans, and we were out there for, a long time, too long. <laughs> yeah, too long to, to be lying on one side, talking face to face to each other. And so the next morning when we came to the service, here I was sunburned on one side, the left side, and Esther was sunburned on the right side. And so we were trying to explain to our congregation and these kids, you know, that we were out there lying on the beach talking, to, uh, talking about our wedding plan. They said, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> But it was a good time, a good time. It was very tiny. <laughs> there was nothing here and nothing here in those days. No. The, the biggest thing was that, I guess it's, I don't know if it was a Catholic church then or the Methodist church now that's in the heart of Costa Mesa. That was the biggest building. And I, when we were driving through yesterday, all those low, top just one-story buildings that were there on, on, I guess it's Harbor Boulevard, what it is now. That, that's all there was to Costa Mesa. Got down into, um, into Newport Beach, and you had some bigger kinds of buildings. Hogue Memorial Hospital was, was just, new, was was just new the year that uh, we left. And so it was beginning to, beginning to grow, but there wasn't anything here. And as far as the college was concerned, uh, <laughs> it was... It was not very much there at all, just a bunch of barracks and uh, bean fields and the adobe that you, st if it got One wet. One of those 12. Um, there are others that we um, kept track of for years and then, I don't know why, but we kind of lost touch. But we think that there <laughs> the one who made the country. Okay, uh, some that were... Um, the one you start out with, Ray. You know, Ray White, so. Well, I don't know where I start with You just have to start right from the beginning of that. Okay. Who made a difference? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, well, there, like I say, there were, there were about 12 uh, 
people that came at one time, and Dr. Ray White was one of those. And it's been especially kind of interesting for us because he has become my husband's colleague in the college where he's teaching now. So who would ever have thought, you know, that that would happen? And then there were others, uh, like we knew of Patsy Grant. Uh, she and her husband were in the ministry for quite a while, but then we lost track of them, so we don't really know where they are. And then um, uh, there were the twins, Jeannie and Bonnie Hoyam at that time, uh, and we know that they were really living for the Lord for quite a long time. But, you know, you lose track, and now you wish, you know, that you had kept in touch with them so that you would know exactly where they were. But uh, anyway, so it, it it's a good... Um, well, it's a feeling that, that's kind of hard to describe because um, to think that you were a part of, of something that, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't very big, but you knew that that's where God wanted you and uh, to be content with where God puts you in, whatever little cog he puts you into and, and to fulfill what he gives you to do. And there is complete satisfaction in that. Yeah. Yeah, well, Esther mentioned Ray, Ray White, Dr. Ray White. Uh, he is a colleague of mine now at, um, at Northwest College in Kirkland, and he is uh, the director of the elementary education program at, uh, at the college. And uh, it is, as Esther said, such a, a, an unexpected joy to have him now as a colleague when he was one of those teenagers that came to the Lord. And, at that time. And I'm, I'm really not that much older than he is. I wasn't, <laughs> when I started pastoring that church, I was 20 years old. And so it was, uh, yeah, it, that's a great joy to see that now. Well, we, I think we tried, like, in, in the Sunday schools. Like I say, it was mostly children that we had in the church. And uh, I think we were concerned or trying to reach out to the parents because all the parents of the, of the children were not Christian. And uh, Dan had opportunities, you know, with, um, like, there were several number of deaths in, in, in families of young people and uh, that gives you an opportunity and uh, we would have you know like I know they don't do that anymore but we used to have Sunday school contests you know this kind of thing and um, that's that's when we broke the record over his head because we had set a goal of reaching Sunday school to a certain point and uh, and we made it and so in those days you could break those those records you know but so. I think probably the, uh, as I reflect on it, I hadn't, hadn't thought of that in years, but uh, one of the things would have been the attempt to go door to door uh, in, the, in the community of Newport Beach. We did, uh, we did do that, uh, canvassing as well as seeking to, uh, to witness to people about Christ in a door to door way. And um, then uh, we did have as, as much as possible missionaries to come. Uh, we always had guest missionaries coming into the, into the service uh, to, to preach and we uh, would take offerings for them. And um, in seeking to, un seeking to remember the history, it seems to me that we, it was early on, I don't know whether it was in my time at the church, but early on we began to actively support uh, missionaries with uh, a small amount of funds that, uh, that we did have. And so those were probably the attempts to, um, to evangelize and reach out to the world with our, with our small group of people. Like, like Esther says, mostly children. One word? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, I guess I feel um, 
that if you are faithful in what God gives you to do and to be willing to be stretched, uh, challenged to do maybe something that you have not done before, um, but to always be available to God and see what he'll do. That's a, that's a hard one. Two things perhaps surface in my mind, anyhow. One is uh, keep the faith. Um, these are days in which a lot of people are, are doing some strange things and saying even stranger things. And to keep faith with the simple gospel of Jesus Christ and uh, not go off in all kinds of tangents, uh, experiential as well as doctrinal kinds of tangents. I would say that to the church. Um, as, I, as I do to my students. And uh, then also, I would encourage, seek to encourage them to, well, I suppose to uh, use the words that appears in Philip's book on his translation of our his uh, paraphrase of the New Testament in Romans 12, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. And I'm, I'm concerned that the church doesn't fall into the trap of believing that this world is, is our home. Uh, we've got to recognize that we're, we're here to do something, to uh, accomplish something for the kingdom of God. And uh, to become too comfortable in this world and uh, want to have all that the world offers us rather than being willing to put our money where our mouth is, so to speak, to reach the, to reach the world for Jesus Christ with, uh, with all that God has given, given the church, whether here in Southern California or in our area in the, in the Pacific Northwest. Very affluent, uh, solid uh, economic situations uh, here as well as there for most for most of our people, and I'm afraid that we're, we're in danger of, uh, of using the great resources that God has given to us to satisfy ourselves rather than to reach, reach the world for Christ. And I'd, I would encourage this church or any church anywhere to, uh, to, see that, uh, to see beyond our noses at that point and realize that we're here for a short time to live for eternity later Let's not spend our time and our efforts on trivia for this life, but look to the future and uh, bringing as many people as we can with us into that kingdom. Anything else you'd like to say? No, just thank you for having us come. It's been, it's been wonderful, you know, to come and see what God has done. <laughs> and indeed, I would echo that. Um, so, so much thanks to all who are responsible for, for this and having us here to share in something of what God has done, uh, starting from just that, just that little seed that was planted both in Newport Beach as well as in Costa Mesa, those two roots coming together to form what we see here. We just, we give praise to God, glory to Him for His work in, uh, in this community and pray that as the desire is, the next 50 years will be greater than the last 50. That would be our prayer and our hope. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>
Well, it was the assembly of God, and that's all I've known all my life, the assembly of God. So when I moved to Costa Mesa, I began to look for assembly of God church. Did the church have any kind of involvement in missions at that time? Yes, we had missions, but of course nothing like now. It was a very small church. You know about how many people might have been there? I have no idea, but it was small. But the Lord always met us. Mm -hmm. yeah. What is your most favorite memory of that, uh, of that church? Oh, I don't know. I think when we'd have our special get-togethers, we'd have always on Easter, uh, we'd have a wonderful service, and then every service we had was wonderful. Reverend Cronick was a wonderful pastor. Was he the pastor when you came? Yes, sir. He was our pastor. Mm -hmm. He what and Mrs. You? What was your uh, reaction when he retired? Well, it was sad, of course. He was not only my pastor, they were very dear friends to me and our family. And it was very sad. And then Brother Woods came along and taking his place, which was a wonderful man. And then, so it's. Uh, do you remember the pastor that succeeded uh, Brother Cronick at the time? Brother Phillips. Brother Phillips. Brother Phillips. And uh, how, uh, have you got any favorite memories of while he was there? No, we still had wonderful services. But, uh, I liked his sermons. We did, he I was a wonderful. And uh, he was only there for a very short time though. But uh, I liked him service. Great. What's your greatest memory of, uh, of 22nd Street? Uh? I think really a, a very friendly church. And uh, I knew some of the people, some of my friends. And uh, I always enjoyed the quartet. They had a quartet, a men's quartet to sing, and I enjoyed that very much. Did you go through any building programs there that you, that, that you can think of? Uh, she did. I didn't go through the no. building program. Okay. I know that, uh, yes. Yeah, we built the new church. Yeah, <coughs> for the pew. Yeah, when we thing. moved into the new church, well, we, uh, I bought one of the pews. And, of course, we distributed for the building on the new church. And, uh, did you have to, uh, was you there when they originally built the first building? No, when the, the first rock the building they had? Mm -hmm. No, I attended in 47 when I started. I but I was there at the opening of the new one, which was opened in 66, I believe. Mm -hmm. okay. what, uh, what brought about the merge of First Assembly in Newport Christian Center? Well, I really, Brother Woods came in and then they emerged with the uh, church in Newport Beach, which was assembly, I believe, or I think it was called the Harbor Assembly in Newport Beach. And they emerged in with uh, our church, which was the first assembly. Was that a, a uh, how did that enhance the uh, both churches? I believe it did, mm -hmm. I believe it did. How did it enhance it? Do you have any specific ways that it enhanced it? Uh, it brought new ideas in, new, and uh, Brother Woods came in, and I, I think that it, it began to have a direction. But uh, my remembrance is it became it's a very spiritual church and, and a prayerful church, and. Uh, I think that that is really necessary to have prayer because you can't have the Spirit if you don't call upon Spirit. What, uh, what do you suppose was the cause for the growth of uh, Newport Mesa after the merge? I believe that uh, members participating, going out, 
talking to people, bringing their friends in, and uh, people began to see that the church was a loving church, an understanding church, and one that cared about people. And I think that uh, people began to realize that uh, there was something there that they needed. Do you remember the old fellowship meetings uh, way back in the early days? In the yes, I do. What, what do you remember about the fellowship meetings? Well, we always had wonderful times in the fellowship meetings. In, uh, did you say 46? No, 47 is when I started. But uh, we just had great times. The Lord blessed every meeting we had. The Lord really blessed. And we just had wonderful time. Who did you have the fellowship meetings with? What other churches? Well, just different churches would come in. We'd have them from different places would come in. Do you know mm. how many churches there might have been? No, we, we no I don't know. I really don't. Okay. If you could say something either one of you, to the congregation about the future, what would you like to say? I would like to say, I, I'd like to see more and more of the members of the congregation become involved in doing things in the church. Because if, if you work in the church, you become the heart of the church. And when the church has a big heart, it grows. And I feel that, and I find it so myself that when I start participating, I start growing. Do you have anything you'd like to say? Pardon? Do you have anything you'd like to say to the congregation? No, I feel the same. I think uh, the more we do for the church, the more we get, there should be more people working in the church and more uh, more people, you get more, blessings, more blessings. The more you do for the Lord, the more we're going to get, more blessings we're going to get. Do you remember living in a uh, and worshiping in the college chapel and the offices and everything in the trailers. Yes, yes we do. Very much, yeah. <laughs> sure do. Watching all the earth work and wondering when it was going to be completed. Remember when we stood on the line with the shovels for the ground breaking, ground breaking, and uh, it had a real spirit of growth then, anticipation. And when the church opened on that Christmas Eve, we had our first service. It was really, really something touching to me. Do you remember anything special about the trailers that we put up with for a while? <laughs> I know they had the offices in the trailer and they had different classrooms in the trailer. But, uh, at least spent most of my, most of my time with been in the chapel itself. When you're thinking back to Costa Mesa, do you have any special memories of the early days of Costa Mesa? What was it like? Tiny. It was a very small <laughs> town. <laughs> two-way street, Newport Boulevard was a two-way street. And uh, no freeways. Arnold Boulevard. In fact, uh, Costa Mesa ended uh, right at Wilson Street. And uh, I remember the little airport they had over on the 19th Street, which is gone now. A very small town. They used to call it Gold Hill. Which side of, uh, where was it, the airport at on 19th Street? 19th. Uh, it was over on the, the west side, side of, of town. Central. Over where the Freedom Homes are there. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What was, uh, you say, Costa Mesa ended at Wilson. What was beyond Wilson? It was, well, it, it was during the war, it was Army Air Base. And after the war, well, then uh, they started uh, selling land off the fairground, took part of it. And in fact, uh, Newport Mesa Christian Center and the college is on part of the old Army Air Base. What do you remember about the war years in Costa Mesa area? I wasn't in war in Costa Mesa yeah. during yeah. the war years. I imagine that's why 
Orange County and uh, this area grew so much is because there were so many soldiers out here during the war, and they liked it. After the war, they thought, well, we'll come back. But uh, that wasn't my case. I, I had uh, been in the Army when I lived in Oklahoma, and uh, after the war, my brother was living out here, and I decided to come out too. I didn't know, but uh, the Lord had a reason for it because I found her. <laughs> Very good. Is there anything else you'd like to say about the early days of Newport Mesa Christian Church? No, it was just a wonderful church, and uh, we enjoyed all the pastors. We enjoyed uh, Dr. Wood so much as their pastor, and we're now enjoying uh, Pastor Bradford and still enjoying the blessings of the Lord there. Great. It's been and my ten, home church for 42 years. And do for many more years. <laughs> So after 42 years, we're still enjoying the blessings, more so than when we first started. You can watch me, you don't have to watch the camera. Okay, okay. we won't pay any attention. We're talking about your word here. Okay. What, uh, approximately what year did you come to uh, the uh, First Assembly Church? 1968. In the fall. And how big was the church at that time? Oh, I would guess there was probably 100 people there, maybe. <coughs> It seemed like it was quite a few. The church was quite full when we, when we went there on Sunday morning. And what attracted you to the church? I think the music, uh, because we had uh, Shirley and Edwin were little then, or young, just about teenagers. And after we had been there a Sunday or two, they said, both of them, Let's go back here. Let's stay here because the music is beautiful. They they really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. And when teenagers enjoy a church and the service and they stay, why that's worth something. Yeah, I think we were attracted to the church by the the worship in the music, and Pastor Chronic was a good minister, and we enjoyed his preaching. And so we just stayed on. What uh, what kind of activities did the church have at that time that you folks were involved in? Well, we didn't get involved in the church too much. We were, of course, at the services and some of the Sunday school classes. But um, when we left the church in Garden Grove, we had been involved, I had been involved in that so much that I was looking for a way out. <laughs> uh, I didn't want so much involvement. I was starting my business and uh, it just took too much. And uh, <clears throat> then we, one of the main reasons we wanted to stay in Costa Mesa, the Assembly of God, was the fact that the children could be involved in it and not have to drive them back and forth to Garden Grove every time they had something going on. And as my wife says, they enjoyed it, and we enjoyed it too. Well, they became involved too. They uh, were secretaries and, and, you know, gathered up all the books and the money and different things for quite some time. So they really liked it until there was different ones came in and and then it changed. Do you remember what kind of involvement the church had in missions at that time? Did they have any mission conventions or anything like that? I don't remember of any mission conventions as such. They just had um, Penny a day missions and things like that that I remember, and uh, different ones gave on and had 
containers or something and used them as far as I can remember. And that was about the extent that I knew of. <coughs> What's your um, favorite memory of the uh, First Assembly Church? Okay, favorite memory of the church. Well, I think the favorite memory goes back to the music and worship. For the worship being during the music period and the ministry. And the uh, friendliness. Friendliness of the church, too, of course. Yeah. I know that attracted others because we met some of them in the parking lot and they would say how they liked it, you know. Did you ever attend any of the love feasts that we that was had over there? I don't remember that we did. On Wednesday night? No, I don't remember that. <clears throat> What's the most outstanding memory you have of the of the church as a whole? <laughs> mm. I don't know. I don't know of any more than what we've said. The friendliness of the people, I think, was one thing, and. <clears throat> I think the thing was that was smaller, you got to know so many different people and uh, it wasn't so big that you didn't, you know, know him. And the pastor too, you got to know him and his family. What do you remember offhand about the merger of the two churches? Well, naturally there was mixed emotions about it. But um, we didn't we disagree with involved. it. We weren't involved. Well, frankly, we weren't members and still not members. You were talking about uh, the merge. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, after the merger, of course, we had some reservations about what would take place. At, uh, we soon learned to like the preaching of Pastor Wood and we enjoyed it very much and it was good to see the growth and the enlargement of the church when they came together and uh, we've enjoyed his ministry down through the years. Uh, let's see. When we moved to the uh, college campus. Did you attend in the chapel? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, we followed the church right on through since we mm -hmm. started going. We haven't went anywhere else t to church to speak of anyway, and we've stayed right with it. Was that, uh, that move an inconvenience at all, you think? Or? No, not necessarily. No, I don't think so. No, I don't think so. Not to us. It was closer, even. <laughs> Not much, but a little closer. And we enjoyed the services there too. What uh, What do you think was the cause for the growth of Newport Mesa? Well, I think it's the many ministries they have, and I think the ministry of Pastor Wood was a big factor of it, as well as all the activities that people could become involved in and uh, that tends to make a church grow and thrive and of course the spirit-filled services that we had. And what do you remember or what, what sticks in your mind when you think about early Costa Mesa what, uh, what comes to mind? Mm. A little, a little one horse down maybe. <laughs> uh, we liked uh, it though for the weather and, and uh, the friendliness of the people and everything. Just took to it right away. Yeah, there was lots of 
farmland around then. Today it's all grown up to houses and not much farmland left anymore. We could see clear into Santa Ana from here, from one of the streets down here, Fairview. That was a little two-lane road. Train used to go out here at the Long Harbor and back to the uh, oh, Air Force buildings that were back here. And uh, I don't know too much of anything else that no. was so different. Well, there used to be a right across the street on uh, Baker, there was a dairy farm there. And we had all the benefit of it. <laughs> <laughs> Of being farmers, it didn't bother us. <laughs> but we liked it here. Just a real nice place to come and live. I forgot about that dairy farm right here. Oh, yeah. There was one down here on the corner of Fairview and Baker. They were all around here. The big ditches on either side of the road when they, they first came. They filled that all in. There's been a lot of changes. Of course, on the other side of Harbor Boulevard, that was all bean field when we moved here. Yeah, yeah there has been lots of changes made. There used to be a train going along Newport Boulevard, too, when we first came. What, uh, what was the first, uh, what year was it when we first came to Costa Mesa? 1955. Mm -hmm. Anything else that you'd like to say about uh, what transpired in the church? Oh, we got lots of nice memories. <laughs> Getting married for 50th anniversary and using our, our first uh, marriage license again. We. Um, our daughter was married there. Mm -hmm. Had a beautiful ceremony. Three of their children have been dedicated there, and things like that have made it home. I guess only two of the children have been dedicated so far. I don't remember. If Emily? Yes, she mm -hmm. was. Mm -hmm. Was Phil from uh, the First Assembly side or the... Uh, mm -hmm. He was from the other church. Yeah, and First uh, First Assembly. Yeah. How long have you been married there? We've been married 50... F no. Oh. Shirley and Phil have been married, what, 11? I think around 11 years. Mm -hmm. 11 years in October. So or 12. I remember shortly after the merger, they got married. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. And how long was that? I don't know. I think I was trying. Probably, th probably twelve years. I think it's been about twelve years. So mm -hmm. then it was probably two or three years later after the merger that they got married. About three years. Yes. More than likely. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah. That would be about right. We just last night interviewed the uh, that was Mike and Cindy because they were the first married. Oh, they is that right? Mm -hmm. Is that right? Mm -hmm. It was just less than a year. Uh -huh. They had different ways and they met from the merger and they got married. Uh -huh. Well, that's the way of <laughs> Shirley and Phil. She mentioned that last night when we were talking about it and said, you know, it was from that merger that we met and got married. Well, that was so there was more mergers than one, huh? Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, well, I guess Cindy and I 
uh, actually started uh, a knowledge of each other when uh, my mom was missionette leader back in, uh, let's see, it would have been 64. 63 or 64. 63 or 64. Uh, just after we'd come down here, at least my family, um, she was missionette leader and uh, she's getting ready to go to missionette camp and she gets this phone call from Cindy Hunt at the time, who's nine, nine years old. That's pro yeah, must have been nine. Well, I was in the missionette group at Glad Tidings Assembly and uh, I was the only missionette who, who had planned on going to camp. And after I feverishly saved all my money all summer to go, I found out that you had to go with a group. So I called a couple of churches in the area, and uh, one of the other churches had, didn't have any space in the cabin that they were going to be staying in. And I had this name of another person to call, and her name was Vi Ellis. And uh, so I called this phone number. And talking, I was about nine, talking to this person that I'd never seen or heard of before, and asked her if, described my situation, and asked if they would have room and she said, uh, we'll make room. And uh, so a few weeks later, I was at Missionette Camp, met her, met her daughter, Pam Ellis. And, uh, you know, just when you're at camp, you talk about each other's families. And I found out that Pam had two older brothers. And that was pretty much the end of it. And uh, then in junior high, Pam and I were in the same school. And in the sa we didn't have most of the same classes, mm -hmm. but we had PE together. And so, you know, she was a face that I knew. So it was, oh, hi, Pam. Hi, Cindy. How are you? And uh, then we had afterglows in those days, mm -hmm. or linger longers, they called yeah. them sometimes. <laughs> and uh, the youth groups would get <coughs> together and, and uh, sort of, of uh, the two churches and sort of combine forces. And uh, we'd, have sing, we'd sing and have prayer mm -hmm. meetings and what have you. And that's the first time I remember meeting Mike. I don't remember a specific time, but I remember knowing that that was Pam Ellis's older brother. And then from time to time, I would run into him, and he worked in Sears, and I remember seeing him in Sears, and I'd say, you know, hi, aren't you Pam Ellis's big brother? How is she? She was always in Mexico. She was <laughs> always in Mexico with Youth Outreach Unlimited, with uh, Paul Bruton was Paul the, the decap at the time. That's right. And uh, she was always in Mexico. <laughs> well, and on my end, after Mission at Camp, I heard Cindy Hunt, a neat little girl who had called and wanted to go to Mission at Camp, and they'd made room. And she turned out to be going to my sister's school. And uh, it just, as Cindy said, uh, First Assembly of God uh, and Glad Tidings and Harbor. Well, mm -hmm. Harbor now uh, used to be. It was Harbor Assembly. Harbor Assembly uh, had the afterglows after over at the church, and they'd have uh, so after church we'd go over there, or, and uh, the youth would get together and they'd sing and they'd pray and they'd uh, eat and <laughs> all the other stuff that you know youth did. And uh, I had no interest in my sister's friends. They were four <laughs> years younger than I was, and. Uh, uh, at, as a uh, 16, 15, you know, 15, 16, 17 year old, I had no interest in even looking at them, much less dating them. <laughs> so my mind was elsewhere at that point. <laughs> um, at Sears, I was 19, and uh, uh, Cindy was, what would you have been then? I would have been 14. 14 or 15. And uh, even then, it's just, that was one of my sister's friends. And then it uh, moved on from there until. Uh, one night after the church is merged, I had gone away for a while and come back, and uh, we met from there. It was either the last week in January or the first week in February. Yeah. And uh, it was near just, Valentine's Day. I remember that. Yeah, it was near Valentine's Day. We, uh, I had gone to the church with a friend of mine, Ken Backman, and uh, we had. Uh, uh, enjoyed the service immensely and stood around talking after the service and Cindy comes up and says, hi, remember me? How's Pam? How's Pam? <laughs> I think she was still in Mexico at the time. <laughs> she was in Mexico at the time. <laughs> and uh, Cindy and I just started talking and... Uh, kept talking. And kept talking. We talked about an hour and a half after the service and they were turning out lights and Ken was getting antsy to get going 
and uh, Did, he had another date somewhere. I think he had another date someplace, yeah. And uh, so we just uh, we talked, and I told her I'd call her the next week. And after that, um, I, I he called. That was your turn. <laughs> yeah, choir practice was on Thursday nights. He called mm -hmm. the apartment where I was living, and I, apparently, and I wasn't there. I tried they a couple said, of times. They said that I was at choir practice. So he called the church. He called the church on a Thursday night and said, gave a message with the youth minister who happened to answer the phone and said, give this message to Cindy Hunt to have her please call me at this number. <laughs> and I'm like, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but I did. I went home and I called him. And, uh, and, Oh, I remember when, after that first Sunday night when we stood around talking, he said, why don't you give me your phone number and maybe we can go out for dinner sometime. And I thought, what a line, you know. I was being Nobody's, honest. <laughs> nobody ever calls back when they say that. <laughs> so when he called, I was really sort of surprised. So I called, uh, I called him on Thursday night, and I think we made arrangements to go out that Saturday night. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, then we ended up and taking, we going to a choir class together at OCC well, for a while. We went out that night. One of the things that I can remember about our first date is that it was so comfortable. There were, it was a real comfort zone for me. Um, the times of silence were not awkward. And for any guy or any girl that has ever dated knows what silence can be on a date, especially <laughs> a first one. But it was very comfortable. and. Uh, I, I enjoyed that. Now, we had prayed, and I had prayed, uh, you know, I can speak for myself, uh, that the Lord would really guide me. And at that time, I was 24, or 23, I guess. And um, I had uh, um, had dated enough to know that I didn't want to just play games. I just, I wanted the Lord's guidance in relationships. And um, when we went out that first week, um, I really felt like, you know, the Lord had guided at that point, uh, I didn't realize how quickly I would realize that. <laughs> but uh, we, uh, uh, two weeks, I saw her like four days out of the next week after that, because she'd worked at the Treasury Department store over here. Um, and he just had to go there and buy something. Yeah. I don't remember what it was. He just I don't know, but I, I dropped by several times. I remember Treasury was high on my list of drop bys that week. <laughs> and, and I remember getting a note on my license plate it was signed me and I thought who in the world would leave a note on my windshield and sign it me <laughs> it took me a few minutes to realize that his initials were M E. <laughs> anyway a, about a month after that five weeks after that five weeks after that I proposed and decided that I had prayed and decided that this was the woman the Lord wanted for me and I proposed and she said yes without any hesitation she knew a good thing too <laughs> And, and uh, then we. Uh, and then there was some fear and trepidation in talking to my dad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Harold <was> a, Hunt. <laughs> I was a sophomore at UCI at the time. Yeah. But I was only 18, and I, I think it's probably not far from the truth to say that my dad was not ready for me to grow up, quite yet, and. Uh, she was living on. I, no, on I was, Balboa Island yeah, at the time, too. Yeah, I was too. living with some roommates yeah. on Balboa Island. And, uh, I will never forget when we had decided that I needed to ask her dad for her hand and go the uh, traditional route. Well, yeah. And uh, so I, we went over. Harold had only met me a once, few times. Once a or twice. Times. She knew, he knew that I was dating his daughter, and that was all the man knew. He knew very well who was sitting next to his daughter during church services. Yeah. And... Uh, <laughs> So I had helped him move a file cabinet in that I had found and he decided he wanted. So I'd helped him move that in and then after that I went in and uh, uh, started talking to him and I talked and told him what I had planned and what I wanted. And, and uh, the Dickens just sat there and smiled and grinned, just would not say a word. And at that point, silence was not comfortable for me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I think you probably caught him off guard a little bit. I think I probably <laughs> did, yeah. And then Cindy came in and... Uh, and he still wouldn't say anything. She started talking and he would not say anything. He just sat there and with this big old... 
Yeah. Grin on I'm his not face. sure whether he was ready to start crying or what. <laughs> but, I'm not quite sure. But, uh, but uh, at any rate, uh, he didn't throw me out. So. <laughs> so six months later, in September of 1974, yeah. we got married. Mm -hmm. It was uh, just just shy of one year after the churches emerged. The churches emerged on September 16th mm -hmm. of 73, and mm -hmm. our marriage, our wedding was September, September 14th, 1974. That's it. <laughs> Would you have ever, you think, met and, and everything else had it not been for the merger? Well, we had met before the merger, but our paths weren't really on, I mean, we weren't really on paths that crossed very often, so I don't think it's very likely. Yeah, I, I think that the Lord knew where we needed to be at the time, and I'm not saying the Lord brought two churches together so he could get us together, <laughs> <laughs> but it may little, have been. It, you that, know. That, that's a little presumptuous, <laughs> probably. Well, the Lord works in strange ways, but yeah. uh, probably not, John. We, uh, as Cindy said, um, we were traveling in different areas at, the, at that point in our lives. Uh, she was still in college. I was out of college. Um, so I don't, I don't see us have ever really gotten together romantically unless the Lord had just done something miraculous outside of that. Yeah. Um, Mike, you come from uh, First Assembly. Yes. How did, uh, how did it come about that you started going to First Assembly? Well, as I said, in 62, I came here with my family, uh, my mom and dad and brother and sister, and uh, we, lived, we stayed the very first night I was in Costa Mesa, we stayed in the motel over by, uh, uh, off of, uh, what is that? Newport? Is it, it's Newport Boulevard, but... Newport and Isabella? Yeah, something like that. It's, it's uh, still there, that, that old motel. And uh, we, uh, my mom started looking around for a church. She was... She's always been a, a great Christian lady, and I have a lot of respect for her. Um, uh, she started looking around for a home church, and she went um, over to First Assembly of God, and uh, Sister Chronic and uh, some of the young married couples there were just so friendly to out-of-towners that uh, she decided that that's where our home church should be. Um, and we... Uh, there was a Royal Ranger program there. There were a lot of young people my age, and that was also an influencing factor. The, the youth group there was great. Um, at that time, they were called CAs, Christ Ambassadors, uh, and uh, they had, uh, we went on uh, snow camp trips and different things that would interest a, a kid of 12, 13, and you know, that age in that area. But that's, that's when I started going to First Assembly of God is back in 62, so it'd been a, it would have been in January, of, actually January of 63, when I actually started going to First Assembly of God. Brother Chronic and Sister Chronic were there, um, and uh, let's see, I guess that's <laughs> a lot of other people there, but uh, I don't know who coming here was there at that time. The Matthiases? No, they weren't there at that time. How, how large was the church when you first come? The church, when I started going there, was, I believe, 70, 70, 80, right in that area. It was under 100, I remember. Uh, and they had the tally board up on the, in the front of the church. And uh, that was before, as a matter of fact, when I first got there, that was when they were in, it would have been the old social hall when the churches merged. It was that old social hall. And then we had went into the building pro program and built the uh, sanctuary and Sunday school buildings over there. But uh, that was before all of that old, that um, sanctuary over there was parking lot when I got there and uh, there was apartment buildings as well, I believe. It's a long time, John. I can't <laughs> so for me to remember that far back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cindy, you come from Glad Mm-hmm. Started going there within two weeks after I was born. Um, my, my parents had gone to Southern California College and were familiar with the church from, from their college days. And uh, I, I'm not sure if I'm getting the story quite straight, but my understanding is that they were on their way to someplace in Seal Beach 
and it was just too foggy, so they stopped at the closest, the, the church that was uh, down on the beach. Um, I think it might have been in the American Legion Hall back then. It's really tough to remember things that far back. <laughs> um, but they, they went there that Sunday and just decided to stay, they decided they liked it. Um, it was, well, at one point, I think ours was the only family going there. There were college students, there were Sunday school kids. They had a pretty good Sunday school outreach, and there was our family, and the pastor's family. I, although for a while the pastor was a college student too. Um, and at one point my mom got, every Mother's Day they gave carnations to the mothers and they would announce mothers with, that took the prize in certain categories. I remember my mom told me that she got the prize for being the oldest mother when she was 26 years old. <laughs> so it was a very young church. <laughs> and then they moved to uh, I think they moved to the a building behind the Edison Company after that. My dad knows the history better than I do. It, it has been a while. And then we moved over to 15th and Monrovia. And I remember the Sunday school classrooms were in converted stables. They would had uh, some horse, uh, like a horse stable, out on the side of this, this house. and. Uh, they built the sanctuary onto the back of the house, and the house served as the parsonage. Mm -hmm. And then the old horse stables were the Sunday school classrooms for a while. And uh, it just it grew from there. Mm -hmm. Who was pastor when you first come in? I don't know who was pastor then. The first pastor I remember was Ira Pratt. I remember going to his daughter's birthday party. After that, uh, I remember Pastor Schultz, and after that, uh, Quanah Bush, and then uh, Ben Venuti, and then we had an interim pastor for a while whose name escapes me, and then Dr. Wood. There's probably somebody else in there. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. We Oh, you did? did you? Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Quantibush? No, yeah. I don't believe so. He was. Well, Quantibush, ben... Quantibush was pastor when I was going into right. fourth grade. Yeah. Yeah. Because Ben Venuti was there. I remember Ben Venuti when ben Venuti. I was at yeah. uh, 63, 64, 65, that area. Benvenuti was pastor from when I was about seven to when I was about fourteen. Yeah. Oh, that's ah, great. That's great. Tell him hello. <laughs> what, um, Cindy, what is your f most favorite uh, memory of the old glad tidings? Construction. <laughs> I every Saturday, it was all the men and all the families and everybody got together to help build the new, the Sunday school wing. And before that, the, uh, the sort of the A-frame sanctuary. But the first construction I really remember being, helping with it all, was the, the Sunday school addition. And uh, I remember seeing the whole thing laid out and, and um, places where the walls would be and uh, the men would do the heavy work and the women would, would bring food. You know, we would all supply food and keep the guys fed and watered <laughs> while, they, <laughs> while they built the church. And uh, it was a large percentage of it was volunteer labor. And they would let, I mean, I was pretty young at the time, but I remember that uh, whatever we could do, they, they let us do. I remember them pouring the sidewalk and uh, getting down on hands and knees and trying to smooth it out and then having an adult say, I think I better take over here. <laughs> but the construction and, and really being involved in um, feeling that the church was more than just a building that you put money into. It was something, I mean, the, the, even the building itself was something that you could put yourself into. Right side of the tracks. <laughs> But we had a Newport Beach address. That's true. <laughs>
<laughs> um, how both churches were growing and how Cindy and I were growing. I think the Lord had a lot to do in both of us before he could prepare us to meet each other, um, age-wise, maturity-wise, and all the rest of it. Uh, at, at the right time, the uh, Lord brought the two churches together um, because it was in his timing. And I remember thinking how it was actually in the Lord's timing that Cindy and I met because just a little bit before we met, uh, she had decided she wanted to concentrate on school and not play the dating games and, and have all the, uh, uh, have to play the games. You, you get tired of playing dating games, I think. And uh, it was time to concentrate on the goals that she had. Uh, which at that time was going to school and you know getting through that and heading towards her uh, eventual goals. Uh, but the Lord brought and with me, um, I had uh, decided that I wanted to. Uh, it was really funny <laughs> because in January I told my mom I said uh, that somehow this year, uh, this is the year the Lord has said I would be married, and I was going, Lord, you're crazy. I said, hey, no way. <laughs> I just don't move that quick. <laughs> and uh, I guess the Lord knew me a little bit better than I knew myself. Because a uh, month after I met her, I proposed. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I did move that fast. <laughs> but I was thinking how after we came together, too, you know, the struggles that have you know, gone on in building a relationship have gone on in the church as well. And how we've had to give and take and, and how we've had to... Um, uh, continually realize and go back to the Lord for uh, His guidance rather than trying to figure everything out for ourselves. And how the Lord has just built such a strong community here at the church. And how, you know, I look at my family and uh, I count my blessings every day because we have healthy kids. We have a solid relationship uh, that neither one of us will end. It, we figured that when we got married, we were stuck with each other. And uh, I think that's sort of how the church was, too. <laughs> After it merged, the property sold, and, you know, you're there whether you like it or not. <laughs> but, that sounds so negative, though. <laughs> but we went into it with a lot more positive attitude, of course. Yeah. But I think that um, with the Lord, because the Lord put it together, yeah. and because he put the churches together, he was able to build one community life, just like he's built a one life for Cindy and I, or, and we have worked at it as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, how the fruits of our labors, if you will, our kids, have come along. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> uh, My but, labor. Uh, yeah, fruits of your labor. <laughs> um, but how uh, the Lord has multiplied here at the church as well, because I look at our kids and I'm so proud to say they're my children because uh, they're mine. And Newport Mesa has also borne children throughout the world. And it's, it's something that a, a parent can feel for, for their kids in that you love them and you want to keep them safe but you realize that They've got to go out and live their own lives. And, you know, one of these days, my kids are going to be moving away from us as well. And, and, but that's tough to, to feel. But um, I remember in a young marrieds class that Wayne Crace taught. Uh, it was right after we were married. Wayne and Barbara Crace taught us some things that have helped us throughout our marriage. And uh, there were a lot of couples, young couples, in the church that were in that same class. And he said, uh, he and Barbara both had uh, Larry and Steve at the time, and they, they had, uh, how long had they been married? 15, no, 16, 15, 16, 17 years, somewhere I in that know. area, and Larry and Stephen were older. And they used, they shared from their personal lives what had gone on, and they said that, uh, you know, the relationship that you have, uh, is something that you will have to work at and continually strive to improve. 
um, and as you become one, you'll realize um, the relationship that the Lord wants between Him and you, as you realize it in a physical or in a physical and emotional sense between your husband and wife. Um, and that kids are are sort of transitory; they're here and then they're gone, and then you're left with each other. And uh, so, you know, I I see the church as just help Cindy and I in our lives. Uh, in not only meeting, but beyond the meeting, and that is building it and and helping us to um, build a relationship in life that is going to stay together. Going back to first assembly again. Mm -hmm. What is your one of your first and mm -hmm. uh, favorite memories of the old church? Oh. Well, I have a lot of fond memories from back then. Um, the uh, <laughs> in uh, when I was, I must have been, I just started driving, 16, 17 years old. Um, a group of young people went over to a convalescent home on Sunday afternoons, and uh, the old people there. Uh, were so appreciative and loved to see the kids coming. And uh, we uh, did everything from uh, play guitars and sing to, you know, just talking with them. But uh, I think that was one of the things that I remember um, real fondly. And I think the other thing, too, is the diversity that we had in the church. We had the grandmas and grandpas and we had the babies. and um, it was more like a family on Sunday mornings. You know, everybody got together and they, uh, after the week, and they, they sort of enjoyed each other, you know, and it came time to uh, praising the Lord and, and nobody was embarrassed, you know, about raising their hands or clapping their hands or, or saying amen out loud or, or just praying silently or, and keeping to themselves. But I think probably the family feel that was in the church when in my earliest recollections of it is probably what I enjoyed most. What do you remember about the trailers and the SCC chapel? You can handle that one. Okay. The first thing I thought of when you asked that question is mud. <laughs> and walking between trailers in, in rain. I don't, know if, I, I don't know if we had a lot of rain that year or if just when we moved over here it was a rainy time, but I remember taking kids to the, the nursery. One of the trailers was designated as the nursery and uh, traipsing through mud to get from one place to the other. And uh, I remember wondering how Mrs. Richards could so confidently care for so many kids, little kids, in such a small space. <laughs> it's just amazing. She really had a touch. Um, nothing particular about the chapel other than uh, trying to get the choir in and out of those itty-bitty rooms in the back on Sunday mornings. <laughs> for me, uh, I had gone to SEC for four years. And so I'd sat in that chapel for four years on a daily basis. <clears throat> and uh, so it was really a sort of a feeling like I was going backwards in time here. Um, but uh, I remember it, uh, I remember it being hot <laughs> because it, we didn't have air conditioning in there as I recalled. And uh, I don't think there was. And I just, I remember it being hot, but uh, um, I also remember um, some really good services in there. Um, and uh, I remember putting on a kids' musical in there. The, that's right. I directed the kids' choir for that's a while, right. and we did yes. kids' praise, yes. and we had Phil Cotton dressed up <laughs> as Salty. Songbook. I cannot believe he did this. He actually wore this costume, blue tights, <laughs> <laughs> blue face makeup. Yeah, Phil, and a you're blue, gonna have to get Phil on camera with that. <laughs> and a blue foam rubber, I mean foam, huge life-size 
hymnal yeah. that said Salty on the front. And uh, right. I remember putting on the kids' musical there and having one of the kids intentionally, of course, do a somersault or a, a cartwheel down the steps of the stage and or jump, I guess she jumped down, the song was jump down, turn around, touch the ground, <laughs> and praise the Lord. And uh, as we sang jump down, as we sang jump down, she jumped off the stage and the people in the audience weren't quite sure what to think. And then she turned around and did a cartwheel and uh, touched the ground and praised the Lord. Yeah. And that was that's funny. one of the things I remember. Yeah. What, uh, do you remember anything about uh, the early days of Costa Mesa? What, how would you compare things? It's a lot busier now. <laughs> a lot of traffic. Um, it's, when I came into Costa Mesa back in uh, six, late 62, January part of 63, um, I remember driving from, we were on the 405 freeway which wasn't even completed. Um, it, it, where did it end back then? It, it wasn't. Ended, it wasn't even through Costa it Mesa. It then. didn't go through Costa Mesa at that time. Um, there was a lot of vacant areas that we drove through. Um, the famed bean fields and tomatoes and all that. Um, but I remember it um, seeming like there was there was a lot of vacant land around Costa Mesa. <laughs> I remember the also one time the youth group went out to a horse ranch to go horseback riding and it took forever it seemed like to get there because we had to go outside the city to get to the ran to this horse ranch and now um, it was let's see where was it it was uh, it was up off of uh, Harbor Boulevard and Warner? right around Warner and Seegers from now and there wasn't any buildings out there at that time. There weren't any. Uh, it was all vacant and uh, real, just nothing. <laughs> it was yeah. the vacant land between Santa Ana and Costa Mesa at that time. Oh, there was vacant land practically between Costa Mesa and Newport Beach. I remember yeah. riding my bike along Irvine Boulevard before Westcliff Plaza was put in. Yeah. Um, I remember, as a matter of fact, I remember riding my bicycle on the 405 freeway uh, before they finished it. <laughs> Well, we were just a couple of blocks away from yeah. where the uh, freeway got put, and I remember mm -hmm. it'd be f they just had, I remember going out there and there would be sticks with little red flags on them. And uh, we'd go out there and there's that real clay soil and the water would just puddle up on it. And there were lots and lots of, of little itty bitty frogs and tadpoles out there. <laughs> and my brothers would bring home buckets of frogs. <laughs> from where the 405 freeway is now. So you were riding up the freeway from me even then. Yeah. Mm. They were playing. Yeah, yeah we, we, we were playing in the freeway. Yeah. Like playing in the fast lane. Yeah. <laughs> so is there anything else you'd like to say? Yeah. Um, I appreciate the church and what it's really meant in my life at this point. Uh, there have been some very, very hard times that Cindy and I have gone through. Um, I remember when uh, I lost my dad back in uh, 79, it was July 20th, 1979. Um, he had died in, instantly in an auto accident back in Oklahoma. And at that time, my mom had uh, been remarried to Joe Easterling. And uh, so nobody in the church really knew who my dad was because this was after the merger and everything, after Cindy and I were married. Um, we were in New Orleans at the time. Cindy was pregnant with Jenny, our oldest, and we got the call at the airport that Dad had been killed in an auto accident. And so we flew to Oklahoma, and I was staying at my aunt's house there in Oklahoma, and uh, naturally I was pretty upset and feeling quite distanced from everybody because my brother and sister hadn't arrived yet. And I got a call from Wayne Tesh. I have no idea how he got that phone number. but. Uh, Tesh called, and he will never know how much that phone call meant. It was, it was so appreciated, and it, it was sort of a lifeline back to the church that really helped me. Um, and I, I remember when uh, later that year, Dr. Wood dedicated Jenny, our oldest, 
And he said, who knows but what this child was born for such a time as this. And that has just struck me with each one of our children that the Lord knows each of our lives and where we are, why we're here. And the Lord has brought us together for a reason. And he'll lead us away from this church for a reason. But the Lord has ministered and used this church in such a mighty way in my life that I really am grateful that it was here and that the people before me had the wisdom and the, and the fortitude to establish it. And I pray that as I've had a part in it, that it'll go on and continue to minister like it did to me. I don't think there's anything I can add to that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sure. I hope we didn't... Newport Mesa has reached a milestone. 50 years of service in this community to the glory of God. It's a time in our 50th anniversary to not only remember with thankfulness in our hearts, but to look forward with renewed purpose and intention. When I assumed the pastor of Newport Mesa back in the fall of 1988, uh, the one word I became incredibly aware of was the word potential. We are a city that indeed stands at the gateway to the city. We're a church that is entering another era in its life. And before us, we have 50 years of incredible potential to reach our community and to shake a world for God. I think if I could put into words uh, the purpose of our life as a church, the thing that I would like us to move towards and strive towards in the years ahead, it is simply to glorify God by being a people who are maturing and multiplying a people who are growing and reaching, a people who are developing and embracing and folding others. We have a world that needs the love of Jesus. We have a community and a city that we live in that needs desperately the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It will take big people to reach a community like that. It will take people who not only know how to grow big in God, but then know how to multiply and reproduce the life of Jesus and others. I look to see maturing, multiplying people of God whose lives are marked by personal integrity, who understand what it is to grow in character. People whose lives are marked by spiritual strength, who understand the foundational power of prayer and the spiritual authority that the Lord's given us. I see people whose lives are marked by reproducing ministry, who both know the gifts and calling that the Lord Jesus has given to every individual believer, but also are committed to reproducing others in the life and ministry of Christ. And I see a church that is committed to the task of world missions. Historically, Newport Mesa has been known as a missionary church. Uh, I have a vision that our giving double and triple and, and move far beyond what we are today in missions giving. I have a vision for us continuing to see young men and women out of this church called into full-time ministry and sent not only to parts of America but around the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is a maturing and multiplying people, people of integrity, people of spiritual power, of reproducing ministry and a missions involvement. And to do that, we're going to have to be a people who really understand the two greatest commandments that Jesus gave. That is to love, first of all, the Lord our God with all of our heart and mind. And then secondly, to love our neighbor. Sometimes I have referred to it as being prayerful and personal. By being prayerful, we embrace the Lord and we express our love to Him and call out to Him for the resources we need to get this great task of spreading the gospel around the world done. And then as a personal people, we understand what it is not only to embrace the Lord, but to embrace one another, to reach out in sacrificial service in this very spirit that Jesus came with when He came to the cross to die, when He came saying, I've not come to be ministered to, but to minister and to give my life for others. Uh, that same spirit by which the Apostle Paul could say, I, I carry in my body the dying of the Lord Jesus. Why? That the life of Jesus might dwell in others also. That is the description of a person who both loves God and is given as a servant to loving his world and loving others. 
That's why my prayer for Newport Mesa is that we be both a prayerful and a personal church, that we understand the Great Commission, that we be a community of believers who loves God and loves the world that God has put us in. It's that kind of community that can then extend in prayer.